to our YouTube channel for any who might have wanted to be able to participate and wasn't weren't able to be present at this moment for whatever reason. And I'm going to offer an opening prayer for us. Let us pray. Train us to be faithful, Lord, and teach us your ways so our lives may reflect you to the glory of God. Amen. Now I'm going to invite Catherine to offer an introduction as we move to our main speaker. And you can unmute and I'll feature your video so everybody can see you as you offer this intro. Great. Hello, everyone. It's great to see your beautiful faces this evening. Um, I'm really excited about the next uh, few weeks uh, of this series that's launching tonight, um, Empowering Beloved Community. And um, I think you'll really enjoy our fabulous speakers, our timely topics, and um, and how we unpack all of this. Um, so this evening we are uh, we are starting out with uh, Jason Evans, who is our first speaker. He's joining us from um, Houston, Texas, and he is Jason is the missioner for missional ministries out of the diocese of texas um, and for those who don't know um, what the diocese uh what what cities the diocese encompasses it's um austin houston the surrounding areas it's not san antonio is that correct yeah so it's it's one of the largest dioceses in the country um he teaches mission theory and practice at General Theological Seminary um, at the Iona Center at Seminary of the Southwest um, and the Iona School for Ministry. Um, I found this really interesting about him. He grew up um, a conservative in a conservative evangelical family and became an Episcopalian while living in DC. So um, Jason also has a podcast uh, called A New Thing about um, uh, about new faith communities. And um, it's my understanding that he has a book coming out, his first book coming out. So with all that, um, I we are just delighted that you are with us this evening, Jason, and um, have at it. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. It's uh, good to be with you all. Good evening. Um, Catherine, thank you for the invitation to do this. Uh, I bring you greetings from our churches and bishops here in the Diocese of Texas. There are two other things that you should know about me. The first is that the Episcopal Church adopted me almost nine years ago. I did not grow up in this tradition, but chose it under the care of the right Reverend Bishop Marianne Buddy, who made me an Episcopalian several years ago. So tonight, I'll share some truths tonight that about the Episcopal Church that may be uncomfortable, but I want to start off by reminding you that I do so out of affection and love for this tradition. The second thing is that I am the descendant of poor farmers who were convinced by white elites that it was in their interest to fight against freedom of Black people in the Civil War. So my words are as much me working out my confession of my lineage as an accusation of those that look like me. I do not come from anything better and I am not anything better. We're in this together. Uh, my work in the Diocese of Texas is centered on starting new communities rooted in the gospel and the Episcopal tradition. When we talk about this work, we often talk about who these new communities ought to be with and for. We do so because too often when Christians look at the great or look to the great commission, we forget the great commandment. The great commission calls us to go and make disciples, which in my line of work, we do by starting new communities with those that would not otherwise be part of the Episcopal Church, and yet this work must be directed by the Great Commandment, where in the Gospels Jesus directs us and how we are to love God, defines who our neighbor is, and how to love them. Both the Great Commandment and the Great Commission direct us into relationships with those we would otherwise exclude. The kind of community that Jesus imagined bringing to get, brings together whomever we are now with, who, with whomever is not here yet. And there are those, as I will speak to in a moment, that are bent on colluding the church and the state. And forgive me for being a bit cheesy, but I would argue that what God longs for is the collusion of the church and the other. On January 6th of this year, 2021, hundreds of Americans rushed into our nation's Capitol building, destroying property 
and seeking the Vice President of the United States and members of Congress whom they viewed as obstructions to their cause. They were also waving flags, American flags, Confederate flags, but also Christian flags. Many were documented praying before and during and after the siege of the Capitol. They quoted Bible verses and wore a apparel evoking Christian idioms. They also hung nooses, wore military gear and carried weapons. Now, most Episcopalians will have likely looked upon what happened on January 6th and said a quiet prayer under their breath that may have carried echoes of those prayers evoked by the religious elites found in the gospels. Thank God I am not like those Christians. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we are not as different as we would like to be. The American civil religion that so many Episcopalians are most comfortable with is merely a domesticated version of the feral Christian nationalists, nationalism we observed on January 6th. Philip Gorski provides a helpful distinction between white Christian nationalism and American civil religion. White Christian nationalism, he says, evokes language of victimization and apocalypse, sacrifice and war. American civil religion evokes democracy, freedom, justice and inclusion, all good things. But what they both seek to acquire or protect is the exceptional status within the body politic by colluding religious belief with national identity. In many ways, adherence to American civil religion hold that which white Christian nationalists desire the wealth and power for white Americans. And this well defines the Episcopal Church. Nine out of every 10 Episcopalians are white. Only 4% of the Episcopal Church is black. We are more comfortable with power and privilege than our piety often allows us to utter aloud. More presidents have been Episcopalian than any other denomination. 35% of Episcopal Church members make six figures or more annually in a country where the median annual income is $31,000 a year. More than 70% of Episcopal Church members make more than the median income annually. Of the 6,300 plus congregations that make up the Episcopal Church, a little less than a third of our 1.6 million members regularly show up on Sundays. And yet, we still gave over $1.3 billion in Platon Pledge in the previous year. We are white, we are well connected, and we're wealthy. This allows us a few things. We can distance ourselves from the, the mess and do not appear complicit with what ails those around us. We can extend charity in ways that clear our conscience, do not have a detrimental impact on our security, all without changing the inequities that required our charity in the first place. And we can do so because of privilege. You may say that we have greater concerns today than wrestling with right, white privilege, and I would say certainly. The COVID-19 pandemic, which we have now been facing for a year, is of great concern. But let me then for a moment reflect with you on what history may teach us of moments like this. The Spanish flu pandemic in 1918 took somewhere between half a million to 850,000 lives. During the Spanish flu, the archives of the Episcopal Church state the severe impact of the 1918 influenza was little recognized in formal commentary. And yet, what documentation we do have is often related to the opening or closing of buildings for worship during the pandemic, and little more. Sound familiar? Can you guess what was mentioned of the Spanish flu's impact on Episcopalians in the state of Texas during this time? Only the postponement of the consecration of Bishop Quinn by a week. Considering our collective wealth and whiteness, it is safe to say that our privilege insulated us from the impact felt, would it be safe to say that the privilege insulated us from the impact felt of the, of the 1918 pandemic? If current as evidence of the COVID-19 pandemic is any indication, yes. Of the half a million Americans that have died during the current pandemic, the COVID-19 death rate of people of color is double or more than that of white people in the US. Privilege did not in 1918, nor does it now in 2021, inoculate us from disease, but it does distance us from its ravages. The impact of the Spanish flu may not have been felt immediately in the Episcopal Church, but a symptom of the church's response may be observable only a few short years later. In September 1925, attendance and income of the Episcopal Church had plummeted so low that it caught the attention of the public and made headlines in the Washington Post. 
Could it be that the apathy and ambivalence of the privilege for the poor caught up with the denomination that was and remains made up mostly of the white privileged class? Time will tell. What will those in our communities hit hardest by COVID-19 know of or care for the Episcopal Church in coming years? We cannot empower beloved community until we first address what ails us. Our complicity with systems that prevent us from approaching the dream of the beloved community that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. articulated must be addressed first. Regarding the beloved community, Dr. King often stated that it was the work of reconciliation and redemption that would foster the kind of environment in which the beloved community could be created. We cannot skip over these two things, redemption and reconciliation. If Dr. King was correct, it is only through these that we might discover this dream. Throughout King's speeches and writings, he frequently harkens back to Jesus' ministry and teachings found in the Gospels. It seems clear that King's imagination for beloved community was an analog for Jesus' kingdom of God, not the nation state. Indeed, towards the end of King's life, it became even clear that his idea of beloved community was not entrusted to the United States alone, but was a global project. When we talk about Christ's kingdom, whether this be referenced in scripture as the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, we must be clear here as well that Jesus is not talking about the transformation of Rome or Israel alone. He is articulating a vision that harkens back to the Abrahamic covenant about through which God promises to bless all people, not one nation or people or an ethnic group, and this got them both in trouble. Nonetheless, whether speaking of the beloved community or the kingdom of God, it may be helpful to think of either of these conceptions as verbs rather than nouns. They both evoked the collective actions and work of those that together create a different way. Both Dr. King and Jesus imagined that this was in response to what God was and is doing. That in response to what God was doing in the world, creating, loving, and redeeming us, we are invited to respond in the same way. There are two directives that Jesus provided us for achieving this, the two great statements found in the Gospels, the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 22, and what constitutes eternal life in chapter 10 of Luke's Gospel. In both cases, the conversation operates around the ancient command to love God with every fiber of one's being and to care for one's neighbor as one would care for themselves. When pressed on the definition of neighbor, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, which in his time would have been perceived as an outsider, a heretic. His definition of neighbor is wrapped up in the stranger. What Christians call the Great Commission is shared at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry before his ascension. He shares this brief moment with his closest of friends, these disciples he's spent the last three years with 24-7. In chapter 28 of Matthew's gospel, in the first chapter of Acts, Jesus commissions his followers to share the story of what God has done through Jesus with others, regardless of ethnic distinction. In Matthew, we read that Jesus' friends are to make disciples, Disciples, disciples were to be those that experienced the presence of Jesus' spirit, were baptized in the name of the Trinity, followed Jesus' teaching and example, and invited others to do the same. In the Acts retelling of Jesus' commissioning, he effectively tells his friends to start at home, to work away from home towards the uttermost parts, sharing stories of what God has done through Jesus along the way. What's interesting in how Acts captures this is the path this expanding mission is on. It might be like saying, start in your neighborhood and then move throughout the county. But then the next location Jesus lists would have likely stopped his followers right in their tracks. Samaria. There it is again, these Samaritans. Remember how poorly Samaritans were thought of. It is as if, as, as if Jesus is making clear that in order for his disciples to participate in God's promise to Abraham, they have to go through the other, the outsider, those that were left out. It would seem then to be no mistake that Jesus includes Samaria purposely to demonstrate that God's mission will always include those we assume are beyond God's reach. Too often in Christian history, we have placed the Great Commission before the Great Commandment. 
Neglecting the first and foremost, we are called to care for the neighboring outsider as we would care for ourselves. When we do so, and the empathy and humanity that is required to participate in God's dreams in ways that both Jesus and King imagined is missing, our work becomes little more than spiritual conquest or the distribution of religious goods and services. If we long for the reconciliation and redemption that will lead us toward creating the beloved community, let's return to the story of the Good Samaritan as a guide. In Luke 10, a lawyer asks Jesus, what do I have to do to get eternal life? And Jesus answers, as he often does, with a question, what is written in scriptures? And the lawyer answers, love the Lord with every fiber of your being and care for your neighbor as you would yourself. And Jesus answers, good, that's the right answer. Live like that and you'll be fine. I'm paraphrasing. But still hoping to trick Jesus, the lawyer responds with yet another question. Yeah, but who's my neighbor? Jesus responds with the story of a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Along the way, he's attacked, he's beaten, he's robbed and left bleeding on the side of the road. A religious elite walks by and passes on the other side of the road. A legal expert walks by and also passes on the other side of the road. It's likely that Jesus' primary audience would have let these two leaders off the hook. They would have been respected in first century Palestine. It's okay, they're good people, they're just too busy right now, but they'll certainly go on to give good speeches and pass good laws that will reduce such crimes. Two people with at least some resources and influence and privilege simply walk by. And then a Samaritan walks by. You notice that Jesus doesn't refer to the status or vocation of this person, simply the Samaritan, just a Samaritan. As the story gets passed down through the centuries, it becomes known as we know it, the parable of the good Samaritan, as if to imply that Samaritans were not inherently good, but bad. This outsider sees the man, bleeding, naked, and near death. The gospel tells us that he draws near him and he has pity on him. He cleans and bandages his wounds. He puts him on his donkey and takes him to an inn and cares for him great per personal cost to ensure that this other man is healed. As Jesus finishes the story, he turns to the lawyer and asks him, who was a neighbor to this man who that was robbed? And the lawyer can't even bring himself to say the Samaritan. He simply responds, the one who showed him mercy. His biases run so deep, he can't even utter the Samaritan. And Jesus responds, go and do the same. The actions of the Samaritan evoke the marks of beloved community elicited by Dr. King, reconciliation and redemption. The Samaritan in the story gets up close and personal to the man wounded on the side of the road and through his own sacrifice makes that man struggle his own. One of the clearest parallels of this story in our age, in my mind at least, may be the family members of those slaughtered by Dylan Roof at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina. After this horrific shooting in 2015, many of the family members of the dead attended Mr. Roof's sentencing. These people whose hum own humanity would not be identified by the shooter stood up one after the other and told Mr. Roof that he was loved, that he was forgiven. They could have sought vindication and dehumanized him just as he had their loved ones, but instead they saw Dylan Roof. They saw through his hate and saw a broken human being and gave him words of affection and care, even as tears of pain streamed down their faces. They were not at that sentencing to appease the court system. They were there to demonstrate beloved community. The work of reconciliation and, redem and redemption is deeply human. It exposes our weaknesses, and folks, we don't like that. Remember that the Samaritan took the time to draw near the wounded man, possibly being late to wherever he was headed and potentially risking his own well-being if those same thieves were somewhere nearby. We are used to having, we're, we are used to moving at the speed of the marketplace, but God's mission moves at the speed of relationships. Relationships take time. Relationships take trust. Neither of those come easy. Reconciling and redeeming relationships require several things, in my experience, that are exemplified in this Samaritan story. 
sacrifice, presence, listening, telling the truth. The beloved community will not arrive by inviting people different than us into our places of comfort and familiarity in order to listen to us speak about justice. We need to be willing to decenter ourselves as white folks, to enter into spaces where we are not the dominant demographic and listen. We have to be willing to earn the right to be heard rather than assume it. When it is our turn to speak, we have to tell the truth and confess where confession is needed. It is quite easy for many of us white folks to say, I'm not racist, and you may be right, but the culture we live in is not unbiased. And people that look like me experience benefits that many others do not. Sometimes we are so concerned with being politically correct that we don't say anything at all. But folks, the pressure is off. We will make mistakes. Accepting this and being willing to confess where we have wronged as individuals and institutions is requisite for the reconciling work Dr. King calls us to in order to create beloved community. The Samaritan goes with less in that story so that the man beaten and robbed may find healing. This sacrifice is not flippant. We are told in the passes exactly how much the Samaritan gives the innkeeper to care for the wounded man. It is a calculated cost. Sacrifice requires that we bring the fruit of our labor, yet in God's economy, we do not offer it for our own sustenance, but for the flourishing of the whole. What is it that we need to sacrifice so that others might be whole? Recognize that contribution to the beloved community is never one-sided. Everyone has gifts to bring. It is not that some have nothing and others have plenty. Even those appearing to be without do have abilities, stories, and capacity to bring to the beloved community. Our systems tend to laud the quantitative achievements of some while depreciating the qualitative accomplishments of others. We need to recognize the contributions of all rather than create systems, systems of dependency. This includes leadership. How can we create spaces that center the gifts and abilities of others, of other leaders that have been historically oppressed? What does this look like in real life? My recommendation is to start slow and small. This might be best organized in small groups. That has been my experience. And I believe people of color should be strongly represented, not the minority. If it is clear that there are not enough people of color to do this work, take a step back and begin building relationships. Your agenda is to listen. Here's the cool thing about the God we follow is the spirit is to be found everywhere. God is doing something in the world in the lives of those around us. Your job is to listen. What you will find is that there's always an opportunity or a need. It may not be and likely will not be what you had would have chosen but what are you willing to sacrifice? And what are you willing to let go of? The kind of communities that emerge slowly over time through this kind of work we call here in our diocese missional communities. While each of them look very different, they all have three similar traits that draw on the grassroots Christian communities we have seen throughout church history, from the hush harbors of the antebellum South to those base communities of Latin America. But first of all, they're relational. They are of a size and a scale that people can know and care for each other. Space where they can learn to tell the truth and listen deeply. It is not so much safe space as brave space, which is language we've learned from Reverend Jennifer Bailey and Mickey Scott Bay Jones and the Faith Matters Network in Tennessee. These are communities where love of others is cultivated. A Houstonian communicator and founder of an organization called Quiet Rebel, Tracy J, speaks of love as an acronym. She says, L is for listening with your heart. O, observe your own biases. V, venture into unfamiliar territory. And E, expect the best. These kinds of relational groups are what we need to do this work. The second characteristic of missional communities is that they are spiritual. All communities are spiritual. As David Foster Wallace said, everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. Of course, you would want to bring the best of your Episcopal tradition to do such work, but do so as a gift without expectation and with an open hand ready to receive what others have to offer. A Methodist pastor, planter, and community organizer, Reverend Brandon Rincher, as 
of whose work you should familiarize yourself. And you can do so at two websites, goodneighbormovement.org and liberatingchurch.org. Brandon says that one of the marks of beloved community is spirituality, which he defines as the work of sustaining the soul through beliefs and practices of prayer, praise, and play. Have fun with this characteristic and color in your prayer book if necessary. Third, these communities are missional. And this means that no matter how established or set in their ways a community becomes, it is always asking themselves the dissentering question of who is not here yet? Whose gifts do we need to invite in? They are always seeking solidarity, another mark of beloved community that Reverend Rencher speaks of. He writes, the work of community building, of sharing and joy and suffering, especially with the most marginalized in order to strive for other being no lack within the community is our charge. Jesus showed us the way to beloved community. He modeled it in loving the least, the last, the lost, and the left out. We cannot follow him by seeking the greatest, the first, the best, and by winning. Be gracious with yourself. Be gracious with others and pray without ceasing. Am I worried about the Episcop what the Episcopal Church will face after this pandemic? Not terribly so. If Episcopalians are good at anything, it's establishing legacies. Will current forms of church suffer and die? Yes. When we have put, when we have not put the needs of those around us before our comfort, this diminishes trust, which will result in fewer churches. We have to come to terms with the unsustainable nature of many of our choices and habits. But will the church die? The church? No. The church, the body of Christ, is much more than buildings and budgets. And after all, we are a people that believe in what Dr. King did. Redemption, reconciliation, and resurrection. If we truly take stock in that, we have little to fear and much to hope for. Thanks, friends. Why don't we open it up to some Q&A? I'm going to switch us to gallery view so it's easier for us to spot if people are looking to, to ask questions. Hi, Randy. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Hi, Jason. Uh, you mentioned starting slow and small, and I'm trying to get a sense of what that would look like. Can you flesh that out just a little bit? That's a great question, Randy. I feel like you and I have met at some point in time, someplace. Camp Allen. That's it. Good to see you again. Thank you. You know what? In our diocese, we have missional communities that are as small as uh, six, and we have some that are as large as 60. Uh, the average size of a congregation in the United States when looking at all denominations is, is 70. So that might be a little bit <laughs> bigger than a missional community when it's getting to that size. But I would say, uh, you know, you can start with as few as two or three. I mean, Jesus said when, you know, two or more are gathered, spirit is with you. So, um, but I, most the average size of missional communities here is probably around 12 or 13. Does that answer your question, Randy? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Laura. Oh, another Hi. familiar face. Wow, Paul, you've got all the cool cats in your congregation. <laughs> another good to one. See you, Laura. In your class. It's good to see you too. You mentioned, and um, I know pride is one of the seven deadlies. So mm. I'm a little recalcitrant to say that I am very proud that Ascension established a, uh, an anti-racism task force calling on the members of color in the core of the congregation to be the foundation of the work. And, and that task force is not all black, that task force is all Ascension. I love it all Christ, it's all Christian. But for others, when you mention that the work must begin and it should begin 
with those of color or at the at least foundationally should include those of color in congregations um that can be a scary premise mm -hmm. um for mm -hmm. some congregations how do we as the black folk helping and wanting to and loving and enlightening the white folk mm -hmm. do that in a way that is um not scary it's not uh we've we've spent a lot of time emphasizing that it's not you know defamation it's not it's not blaming it's not guilt casting we we love and we're so glad that you're allowing us to make these steps or allowing yourselves to learn something right. are there are there are there ways to to do that that runs easier through the ethos of a congregation so i'll re i'm going to refer back to brandon rencher the methodist pastor that i have been working with um, from time to time and Brandon strongly emphasizes to not start the work if people of color are the minority in the group. So if we have a small group of people, let's say, and there's one person of color and then there's three white folks, that really puts that puts the, the person of color in a really unfortunate standpoint. And so um, I think it's really important that people of color are not the minority once we begin to draw the circle together. Uh, that because that's part of the vulnerability that's part of the uncomfortability is if you're the one person that has to carry the brunt of the whole conversation as the perspective of a person of color i can't imagine i can't i cannot literally imagine what that would be like and that's not a, a just or fair thing to do and so that's why i say to folks when they're looking to start explicitly anti-racist missional communities to say if they say well gosh well we've got we've got just a small handful of people of color but we've got you know eight of us white folks that are just raring to go, we want to do this. And it's like, that's great intentions. You, you have more work to do still. And what often that means, just going back to the statistics that I shared at the beginning, is that you have to start with people outside of the Episcopal Church. You, you can't just have people, for, and it might even be better that it is, it is a makeup of people from in and outside of the church uh, so that we can have a different perspective. Um, and so we go back to the practices of listening. Um, that might look like a group of folks from a congregation going and visiting uh, an African-American congregation or uh, a Spanish language congregation on a Sunday morning or a Korean Presbyterian congregation or whatever it is, but like starting to the practice of holy listening to what God is doing through the eyes and ears and, and experiences of and others and building those relationships before you're at a place where you're ready to have some equity and starting something together. Am I answering your question, Laura? Is, is that- You absolutely are. Thank you very much. And it's so good to see you too. <laughs> Thank you, you too. Okay, forgive me if I missed the obvious here, but um, I, first of all, I thought your talk was great and I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Um, you, I was wishing I was taking notes, but my cat was immobilizing me and I, I, don't, I didn't want her to move. <laughs> my Apple pin just beyond reach. But um, yeah, so I guess I missed the part where I don't know what a missional community is. And um, I'm not sure what the invitation is. Like, what sure. are we invited? I mean, you gave some really great, awesome points and it was. Mm -hmm really enlightening, but um, I don't know what that means or. Sure, let me, yeah, let me just give you a little bit of background on the idea. It's it's something that in the Diocese of Texas, we have been experimenting with for about six years or so now. Bishop Doyle started talking about this a few years before I came here, which is now about five years ago. So maybe six, seven years ago now. Uh, but the idea is something that has been around the Christian tradition on the margins of the Christian church throughout the ages. And usually what we see when we look at church history, uh, whenever the church becomes, the Christian community becomes inaccessible to a particular group of people for whatever reason, that could be geography, it could be um, it could be culture, it could be any variety of reasons. We can look back early to the early monastic movement, um, Antony in the desert, and we can see that one of the things that Antony was doing was trying to create access because as, uh, as the church became more solidified and uh, more uh, closely aligned to empire, um, 
there was a there was a lot of dis, uh, inequity in in access to to Christian community, um, and so he he went to the desert to try to try to create space for people that could not participate in church. They couldn't afford to to contribute in me and financially or what have you to create Christian community with folks uh, with, that, with, in different ways. We also saw this in the in in the uh, antebellum South here in the United States. We've seen it throughout history, but just a few examples. I'm going to give you. So I'm going to jump through major. Uh, centuries here. In the, in the antebellum South, um, initially slaves were not, were prohibited from participating in Christian community. Uh, slave owners did not want Christians to hear the Christian message. They certainly didn't want them to be exposed to um, parts of the Old Testament like, uh, like Exodus, etc. And so that, but still the Spirit of God blows across all people, and they got hints of the gospel message and began to form what was called hush harbors, uh, which were they would, they would steal away at night to gather for Christian community with each other. We, say, we saw the same thing in Latin America, mostly starting in about the middle of the, of the 20th century, when uh, the growth of the church was happening, was proliferating so much in rural poor villages, the Roman Catholic Church could not actually keep up in getting enough priests out to celebrate the Eucharist. And so villagers started forming what they called base ecclesial communities, which were these communities where they would come together and they'd often listen over radio wave to sermons from priests or, or nuns doing Bible studies from major cities, and then they would shape community around each other. Throughout these various descriptions of community that are on the margins, it is always about who. It's always who does not have, um, who cannot be a part or will not be a part of a traditional Christian community. Uh, so, and, and once we identify who that is, what that per people group is, in our time and place, obviously, it's not like we're trying to exclude anybody, but there are oftentimes geographical boundaries. There's a highway that cuts through town and people just don't cross over the other side of the tracks or the highway, as it were, or there's language barriers. There's a growing population in town because of a new industry. But they don't speak English or uh, whatever it be. There's, there's towns that have high numbers of of deaf populations because they have a college for deaf in that town, which is rare to have a very geographically rooted deaf community, but maybe because they're not hearing, they can't participate actively in a regular congregation. Once we know who it is that cannot participate in a traditional church, what does it look like if we were to go and try to create Christian community with them? So that's what missional communities have meant for us is trying to harken back to these ancient practices of creating Christian community on the margins for those that would not otherwise participate in a traditional church. And, uh, and, and they have always had throughout history and what we try to train around are those three traits that I mentioned of they are, they're highly relational. So they do practices like eating together, uh, sharing resources that nurture meaningful relationships. They're spiritual, so they're doing things from singing songs together, doing Bible studies, some even do a full Eucharist or evening prayer, compliment, morning prayer, all sorts of different things. And then lastly, they always have a high component of otherness. They're always asking who is not here yet? Who are we called to bless or befriend or advocate for or partner with or tell the story of? Um, those three traits, we see them throughout the history of the church. Whenever the spirit is blown upon God's people and push them to the margins to create commission, Christian community where it was not before. After five years, I've gotten that, I've got that down pretty fast. Wow. <laughs> does that help, Neely? It, it, it does. So I'm, I'm just trying to connect this to um, our anti-racism task force work. Uh, in my head, you know, so what would this mean to build missional community around anti-racism or, you know, in my own world, I'm interested in sort of the absence of the homeless or the mentally ill in the church. How would we build missional community around that? So I'm curious, sort of, are we taking a racism focus in this? I'm still confused on the invitation. <laughs> I, I definitely think there should always be an, an anti-racist uh, component to this type of work. Uh, this, that's why the equity and how we start this work is important uh, to make sure that we're not, uh, that, that, there, that there are people of color fairly represented in the starting of this type of work on the margins. Um, uh, we actually just completed a series called uh, Starting Anti-Racist Missional Communities. We're going to be putting that up online 
the recorded sessions and kind of teaching notes from it. Um, hopefully within the next month after we get through our own diocesan council this weekend. Um, you can find all of the resources that we put together around missional communities at epicenter.org slash missional. How egotistical is it of a diocese to acquire the URL epicenter? I mean, that's, wow, talk about empire. I said it, you guys didn't have to say it, I said it for you. <laughs> so Neely, I just wanted to highlight, and for others who may be interested, I wanted to highlight his, uh, Jason's um, podcast, a new thing, I mentioned it earlier, but um, he talks a lot about missional communities. I mean, that's that's basically what his, his focus is. So. Um, I, I found them, I've, I've listened to a few of them and I found them um, really enlightening. So, um, and Jason, aren't you, I, I'm, I listened to you and I've, while I was listening to you, I was thinking this is, and you'd mentioned um, St. It wasn't St. Augustine, St. Angelo, maybe St. I mentioned maybe? tonight, I mentioned Anthony the Great. Okay, Anthony the Great. Yeah, so I'm familiar with um, like Benedictine yeah, uh, spirituality and, and St. Benedict. And, mm -hmm. uh, but what you're really talking about is, is like monastic communities in a, um, mass, monastic communities in a, in a, um, in a, for us, it would be monastic within a church environment. So we're all kind of doing the same thing. Yeah, uh, I think it, it has, it definitely has a, a, a similar root and there's a, when we have, I mean, when we say monastic, we tend to think of, you know, Friar Tuck, you know, you know, people right, in right. robes, yeah, you know, very different looking, yeah, mostly dudes, you know, with funny haircuts mm -hmm. and such. Uh, but monasticism is is a really uh, wide and beautiful and eclectic yes. uh, expression of Christian spirituality across the ages, and has looked a lot of different ways because of faithful Christians that were trying to be responsive to the context they were in, oftentimes because they realized uh, there was somebody that did not um, have access to Christian community, that had not heard the gospel and they wanted to respond faithfully. So yes, like it, it, it is in many ways related to monastic traditions in that way. Um, the, you know, one of, one, some of the beautiful versions of a monastic mission that we have are of men and women that have entered into community, a community and established, you know, village, town, city, whatever, and become part of the fabric of that place. And by binding their own well-being to the well-being of the pe other people in that place, found mission together. And if that's what we're hearkening to, then I, um, yes, yes, let's do more of that. It's, it's the other kind of mission where we have coerced uh, people into Christianity um, and taken an approach that exports a cultural framework from one place to another onto other people that we have failed miserably and we're still we're still confessing our way out of and learning new ways of being Christian Christian even today. I think Suzanne or Susan yeah. was going to try to say something. Yeah, I was going to try to say something. Um, one of the things that, that some of us have kind of kicked around is the idea of partnering with a uh, predominantly black church in the neighborhood or in, at least in the, the city and trying to do a lot of connecting, getting to know each other, sharing our stories back and forth, and then hopefully moving toward some joint projects together that would be in the community and everything. Would you consider that a missional community or, I mean, or would you consider that something really a little bit different, but still good? So one of the things we often talk about here, um, Suzanne, is it Suzanne or Susan? It's Susan. Susan. Okay. Uh, that's my mom's name. It's great <laughs> to meet another from Susan. Uh, one of the things we often talk about is that sometimes it's more important to think about the kind of missional practices we need to adopt than worrying about a missional community as an outcome. Uh, and what you're describing sounds like a lovely missional practice of going and, uh, you know, demonstrating holy curiosity, genuinely being interested in how other faithful Christians view the world, and then finding ways to partner together uh, for the good of the community. That's awesome. And what I would say is do that and let the Holy Spirit show you what is supposed to come out of that next. Listen deeply, listen well, practice holy curiosity, ask really good questions, um, tell the truth, and see what happens out of that. 
Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for doing that. That sounds like a really great project. Jason, can you just tell me what the, the acronym love, um, you mentioned that earlier. So you've got love, L is listening, O is- Listening, yeah, listening with your heart. Uh -huh. Obser o, observe your own biases. Mm -hmm. V, venture into unfamiliar territory. Okay. And E, expect the best. Tracy J works uh, quite a bit with the Diocese of Texas around safeguarding training and such in her organization. Okay. If you just Google uh, quiet rebel, you'll find Tracy and she's, she's fantastic. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You had mentioned one other resource you'd cited two websites and I, I would like that name and those sites again too just and maybe a little sure. bit more about who I mean you were you were uh, advocating for us to invest ourselves in an individual so I mean a little bit more about their work or or why they're uh, getting high praise would be great sure so I, I'm gonna drop both of those Perfect. in the chat for you all um, so Good Neighbor Movement is the Methodist church plant in Greensboro, North Carolina, planted by Reverend Brandon Wrencher. Like I mentioned, Brandon's a Methodist elder. He's a community organizer, pastor, church planter. And the, it, is a, it is a decentralized collection of communities. So it is kind of like um, a network of small groups that make a church together, uh, Good Neighbor Movement. Um, Brandon is working with a lot of other Black leaders across North Carolina and beyond on something called liberatingchurch.org. And they are drawing really deeply on a lot of these historic expressions of Christian community um, in North America that are underrepresented in uh, academic work. Um, I mean, you know, most people have not heard of things like the Hush Harbor traditions and how important it was, even for its influence on uh, the, the early expansion of the church across the West, uh, which was in great deal by the Methodists through things like camp meetings and the fact that um, camp meeting organizers often found out how good a preachers were gathering in these hush harbors and asked them to come preach at their camp meetings because they could preach better than the, the white pastors that were preaching. Uh, and so, I mean, there's a long history there, but it's just, un, it's, it's, it's under documented. And so the Liberating Church Group, was Brandon Rencher, Anthony Smith, um, uh, Vanika Williams and a variety of other leaders, uh, academics and pastors that have gathered to uh, work on better documenting those lessons that have been learned from uh, the historic African-American church from chattel slavery on uh, for all of us to benefit from. So those, so Good Neighbor Movement, that's uh, the, the, the church plants website, lots of good resources and ideas for how people are organizing in some of the ways that we're talking about here and uh, Liberating Church is the broader website of their work. I think those were the only website. The, uh, the only other website I might point you towards, I did mention uh, Reverend Jennifer Bailey out of Tennessee. She uh, is the director and founder of Faith Matters Network there, which is a religious-based community organizing, um, ju social justice organizing group. And they have a website called thepeoplesupper.org and they have some great things, some great tools there for gathering people across differences for the sake of creating brave space uh, where people can explore a more just future together. Yeah, that's great. I think all of those are helpful in terms of like sparking the imagination. Absolutely. Uh, not always a, a replication, right? I mean, so no, I, yeah. What works in one context just isn't. I mean, I think we we sometimes are guilty of that as church. We we want that same secret recipe that led to the success to somewhere else when really we need to be inspired by those examples and look around and listen, as you'd said, um, and listen well to our neighbors so that we can come up and innovate some of those things for ourselves. So. Yeah, that's really well said, Paul. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I, I know I've been guilty of that too, right? I mean, it's so easy to be enchanted with um, what is really impressive ministry elsewhere. 
and we should we should be we should honor it we should lift it up we should look at the website so i'm glad to have those resources but ultimately we really do need to invest ourselves in it you know in the way that they did right be inspired by their effort and their process as much as the outcome good word yeah totally agree we do have a few minutes still i i know there may be some lingering questions i don't want to keep speaking i want to leave room for others and i just wanted to throw out a uh, a an ad for public television they're doing a series on the black church that is amazing and they have been talking a lot about the the development of these secret nighttime slave uh, worship areas and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's on KDRA right now, and you can definitely uh, get some of the back uh, previously recorded ones. So I'll recommend it. Yeah. There, and our it, presiding bishop participated. Yeah, he shows up a few times uh, yep. in that. You can watch it on um the pbs website as well as so you can stream it for free there black church great any other questions from from the crowd we can uh um, jane it being as it is lit now I wondered if you had a practice that might be helpful that you think may be helpful for us to think about, particularly during Lent, um, in terms of what we've been talking about as well. That's really great. Well, there's a few things. If you're if you're already giving something up for Lent, uh, I, I would recommend you calculate the cost of whatever that is. So if you decide, okay, I'm giving up my daily mocha or latte or whatever it is. Um, what does that cost you? Uh, why don't you just take that money and donate it to a local Black Lives Matter group or, or some other group that's doing some kind of mutual aid work in your community, but providing relief. Um, there's also a really great book by Michael Frost. He's a missiologist based out of Australia called Surprise the World. And it's a really short, simple little book, but he describes basic missional practices is what he calls them. And there are a few things in there. Um, he uses this acronym and I'm, I'm reluctant to share it just because I'm like, I'm not gonna remember what they all stand for. Uh, <laughs> but the acronym is BELLS. Uh, but uh, the, the, I know that the, the, the first one is, uh, stands for blessing somebody. So just generally trying to do um, kindness to somebody. But the, the practice that I really like uh, his articulation around is making a practice of sharing a meal with at least one other person a week. Um, I know it's a little hard during COVID, right? But you could have, you can have Zoom coffee, you can have Zoom happy hour, you can have a Zoom meal uh, with somebody. And the practice is to do most of the listening and as little talking as possible. So I usually say, try to do 70% of the listening and 30% of the talking. And by, you know, this is one of the things that I think a lot of people, a lot of us long to be heard more. Think about how edifying and how good it feels when you really feel heard by somebody. When somebody really just pays attention and listens deeply to what you have to say, that's a huge gift. And especially amidst all the isolation we've experienced through COVID, but also just through this crazy storm we just experienced too, where so many of us didn't even have cell coverage for a day, two days, three days, maybe longer. Um, we really have become familiar with isolation. So give somebody the gift of listening deeply. And before you go into those conversations, ask God's spirit to enlighten you to what God is doing in that. The last thing I'll mention as far as practices, and I know you guys are almost upon the hour, so I'll make this quick, is speaking of, of monastics and ancient spiritual practices, um, start practicing the examine. Uh, you can Google the examine, E-X-A-M-E-N, examen, um, and there's some great podcasts that'll guide you through the examine. Uh, you can also, there's several Catholic websites that you can download little 
PDFs of instructions on the examine. The examine was simply a practice developed by St. Ignatius to help people recognize God at work in the daily. This is the, this is the missional project, right? Is to, is to notice where God is at work in the world around us. And so uh, a, a practice that helps you stop and say, where was God at work in my life today? Where did I say yes to that invitation to partner with God? Where did I say no? It's going to change how we look at the world around us. It's going to change how we interact with people. And if we hope to see God at work through acts of justice and change of building reconciliation or in redemption, we need to have eyes to see where God is at work in those things. And so the examine is a real easy practice to adopt and either do it at the very end of your day or do it at the beginning of your day and reflect on the previous day. Um, I think that can be one of the best missional practices you could adopt during. Thank you, those were great. Those are fantastic. Jason, we are uh, thrilled that you were able to join us tonight. We thank you wholeheartedly. Uh, I get to thank you on behalf of everybody, but you'll see the enthusiasm on their faces and, and some <laughs> applauding from their screens as we um, embrace the wisdom and the sharing that you have offered us. We are grateful for your time, for your presence, and for your leadership in the church. Uh, the resources that you've offered will hopefully inspire us. I, 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 I can see it. So um, that's very exciting to me. Um, and we have recorded this evening. So if you run into folks from Ascension or uh, Jason, if you'd like to be able to share it, we would love for others to uh, share in this time with us. Uh, continue to uh, learn from what has been offered here and from your words to us. Uh, it will be on the YouTube channel that we use to post all of our worship. I'd ha be happy to send you a link as well, uh, Jason, if, if it's helpful to you. We'll have a little playlist as our series continues, and I do hope to see each of you back. Invite a friend or three if you'd like uh, next week as the Empowering Beloved community uh, continues. We will have the Reverend Dr. Rodney Sadler, who is the director uh, of the Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation at Union Theological Seminary. His talk is titled, Race is Nothing, Race is Everything. And so... Uh, we will look forward to his words for us next week. I'll offer uh, a closing for those who might be leaving and to complete this portion of our call. And then we're going to uh, hold some silence um, in this in-between as we prepare for Compline. We'll literally be preparing. We'll feature uh, that as we see those preparations and candles being lighted. It is okay to step away. If you have to retire for the evening, we completely understand. If you need to use the restroom or let the dog out, uh, we will begin Compline at 8.15. So you have about 15 minutes for those needs. And then we will resume with Compline. For now, I'll offer this. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors.